Thank you and welcome everyone. And I'd like to ask you to join me in an opening prayer as we call on the four directions, on the four corners of the world to be with us as we open sacred space. And in the medicine traditions, we always work within sacred space. <laughs> to the winds of the south. Hatunamaru, great serpent, mother of the waters, we call on you, mother. Come and wrap your coils of light around us. Teach us your way, the beauty way, to walk with beauty on the earth, to shed the past the way you shed your skin, to touch everyone we touch with beauty. Be with us. Ho! To the winds of the west, Otorongo, mother, sister, jaguar, we call on you, mother. Come and walk among us. Teach us your ways of integrity, of impeccability, of fearlessness, of stepping beyond death. Be with us. Ho! Oh. <laughs> to the winds of the north, grandmothers and grandfathers, ancient ones, guardians and keepers of this land, you who've walked here before us, we come to honor you today, and you who will come after us, our children's children. Hummingbird, we call on you, teaches your ways of drinking deeply from the essence of life. Ho! Oh. <laughs> to the winds of the east, the place of the rising sun, mother eagle, sister eagle, condor, we call on you. Come, Mother, teach us your ways of soaring above the clouds and the ways of the nest and the ways of the caring of the young. Be with us. Ho! Santa Tierra Pachamama, Great Mother, Mother Earth, thank you, Mother, for holding us so sweetly, for your breath, for your waters, and to all our relations, the stone people, the plant people, the creepy crawlies, the winged, the fur, the finned, all our relations. Ho! Intitaita, Father Son, and Grandmother Moon, Hatun Chaska, to all the star nations, our star brothers and sisters, Yapanapukuna, the sacred mountains of this land, Hanilia Tixi Wirakocha, Great Spirit, Creator of all, you who are known by a thousand names and you who are the unnameable one. Thank you for bringing us together today to celebrate the song of life one more day. Ho! Oh. So the shaman is the person who mediates between the visible and the invisible world. And it's an individual who Traditionally, who comes from a traditional culture, from an aboriginal culture, not from, a, not from an industrial culture, not from a developed culture, but from a, the societies of the earth peoples, the people that work the earth, that work the land, from traditional societies. And shamanism is not a religion, like we like to think of it sometimes, but it's a spiritual tradition, it's a spiritual path. Because religion, in fact, you can be a Jew, a Christian, a Muslim, a, uh, an atheist, and still be a shaman. Because religion is built on belief, is founded on belief, whereas shamanism is founded on experience. It's a spiritual path founded on your experience, and honoring, of course, the experience of those who've come before us. But it's not based on the experience that someone had 2,000 years ago. And the difference between the priest and the shaman is that the priest celebrates and memorializes an event that occurred 2,000 years ago, whereas the shaman celebrates and memorializes this moment, this instant right here. And there's no Buddha, there's no Christ, there's no Muhammad that says, follow my footsteps, that says, follow your own footsteps. And if you meet the Christ, bow to the Christ. If you meet Muhammad, bow to Muhammad. If you meet the Buddha, kill the Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's what the Buddhists say. 
Because if you happen to meet the Buddha on the road, you know that you've missed the Buddha because you are the Buddha. You've missed your own Buddha nature. You're projecting it onto another. So the medicine way is a spiritual path and is founded in a mythology that is very different from our Western mythology because it's a mythology of the feminine. And in the West, we have a mythology that is very much of the masculine. <clears throat> we have a rather funky mythology in the West, in fact. And I want to review some of these elements so that we can better grasp these, the context and the, and the arena in which shamanism thrives. Joseph Campbell used to say, I, I remember having dinner with him many, many years ago, and he said two things to me. He said, Alberto, if you don't learn it, you end up marrying it. <laughs> That was number one. And number two is, we'd had a couple of glasses of wine, was that reality, what we call reality, are those myths that we haven't quite seen through yet. Reality are those myths that we have not quite seen through yet. And I'd like for us to take a moment and look at our Western mythology because mythology informs and organizes, provides us with the lenses through which we perceive reality. <clears throat> so, the, in our Western mythology, for example, we have the only mythology in the planet in which we were cast out of the garden. Did you know that? That nobody else was kicked out of the garden, the Aborigines weren't, the Sub-Saharan Africans weren't, the Native Americans weren't. They were given the garden to be the stewards and the caretakers of the garden. But we were cast out of the garden. We were cast out of our original nature, where we used to walk with God. We used to speak to the rivers and to the trees and to the clouds, and the rivers and the trees and the clouds, and God would speak back to us. And as we suffered this initial, this original soul loss that we've all inherited, we are still paying for the sins of our great-grandparents. We've been banished from our original nature. Nobody else on the planet was. In fact, the Aborigines, the Native Americans, were given the garden to be the stewards and the caretakers of the garden. They were not banished from the garden. Not only that, as we were being banished from the garden, there's a voice that said to us, and cursed is the earth because of you, and you, and you too, woman. And to the man, the voice said, and with the sweat of your back, you will take your food from the earth, and it shall grow thorns and thistles for you. The vo I'm not making this up. This is page two. And you, you can check this out next time you stay at a motel. Because right at the beginning of our mythology, we managed to piss off the feminine and the earth because curse is the earth because of you, woman. And to the man, the, the voice did not say, and the earth shall grow papayas and strawberries and mangoes for you. No, it said, the earth shall grow thorns and thistles and with the sweat of your back. So we enter into a hostile relationship with the earth, right at the beginning of our mythology, with the feminine and with the mother. And later on, we learned that matter, like the stool or this table, is not spiritual. That spirit is something separate from matter. And of course, if you remember your Latin, where does the word matter come from? From mother, from maternity, maternal matter. So, the, so our mythology from the very beginning is rather funky. For example, it also tells us that the masculine gives birth to the feminine. Remember that part of the story with the rib? We have the only mythology in which the masculine gives birth to anything. <laughs> to anything. <clears throat> so, the, um, so our mythology really predisposes us to a perceiving reality in a particular way. For example, in our mythology, we have an independent evil principle. We've identified an independent evil principle. For the shamanic societies, there's no independent evil principle. Evil exists 
but only in the hearts of men and women. There's no independent evil principle that you have to protect yourself from. But for us, there is. We have a universe in which there is a Darth Vader. And, the, and we have to wear the amulets and protect ourselves from the... Whereas in the indigenous traditions, we live in a benign universe that will actually go out of its way to conspire in your behalf if you're in proper relationship with it. Now, medicine picks up on the same mythology and says that we live in a universe that you have to be protected from, that the minute that you cut your skin, that there are invisible microorganisms that are coming and feeding and having sex inside you. <clears throat> well, biology doesn't quite put it that way, but it's, this is what they're saying, that the minute you cut your skin, you are exposed to this hostile environment that will become predatory. And that whereas in the medicine traditions, the, of course it's a good idea if you cut yourself to, to you know, to wash the cut and to rinse it off. But in the medicine traditions, we live in a benign universe. In fact, for the shaman, there's no difference between being killed by a microbe and being killed by a jaguar. They're exactly the same. Whereas for us in the West, being killed by a microbe is an illness, and being killed by a jaguar is an accident. Poor Sally, she got eaten by a cat. Bad luck. For the shaman, they're identical. They're exactly the same thing. There's no difference between the two of them. We have to be in proper relationship with microbes and with jaguars. Otherwise, they both begin to look at you as lunch. But if you're in proper relationship with them, you're no longer part of their food chain. So this is an essential element of the medicine traditions. I've worked with clients who have I remember we get a lot of physicians that come into our, into our healing the light body training where we train Western shamans. But they generally come to us when they are hurting. And I remember this physician who came who had been diagnosed with cancer who says to me, Alberto, the chemo isn't working. And we have three sessions together. He comes in on the fourth session and he says, great news, great news, the chemo is starting to work. I go, what? <laughs> the chemo is working. It's like fabulous, fantastic. Then he signed up in our, and became part of our training program and is now a shaman physician who practices shamanic medicine in the ER, which is a fabulous place to practice shamanic medicine. And the, um, in fact, he was telling me the other day, Alberto, that we lost this patient. He came into the ER, we lost him. And I was praying over him. I was doing the death rites, helping him to make his way across from this world to the next consciously so he wouldn't be trapped in this plane between the worlds. And, the, um, and this resident comes and he says, he's already dead, doc, come on. And he, said, he says, no, 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 this is where he really needs to be healed is now. And the, um, so our mythology predisposes us to a particular reality. Our mythology informs medicine in the same way that it informs science. For example, our mythology tells us that in the seventh day, creation was complete. That the birds and the butterflies and the eagles and the whales had been created and all that was left was the naming of the plants and the animals. Whereas the shamanic mythology says that on the seventh day, the great spirit said, you know, I did the butterflies and I did the hawks and the eagles and the flowers in the field, and now you finish it. So creation is not complete. It's up to us to finish creation. We call this dreaming the world into being. But in the West, we inherited a creation that was done, that was complete. And all that was left was the naming of the plants and the animals. And physics, of course, picks up on this mythology and says that on the seventh nanosecond after the Big Bang, that all of the laws of physics were created, and all that was left now was coming up with the unified field theory that would name them all. But for the medicine people, everything in the universe is evolving, even the laws of physics. 
So mythology informs reality. And we inherited a mythology in which we were banished from our original nature, cast out of the garden. And I remember one time walking through the Amazon with a medicine woman and her husband, and we came to a clearing in the jungle, and they said to me, Alberto, walk across the clearing and see what happens. And I walked across the clearing, and I entered the rainforest on the other side, and the birds were singing, the jungle was full of song, the macaws and the monkeys, and I take the first step, the second step, the third step, and everything stops. And they come up to me and they say, see, they know you've been kicked out of the garden. <laughs> <clears throat> they know you don't belong here. You know, and I was trained in science, so I go, right. You know, I'm sure they were smelling my toothpaste and my underarm deodorant and my athlete's foot powder. So there were two Shipibo Indians about 100 yards away who were cooking a boa. They were roasting a boa on a spit. And I walk up to them and I ask them if I could have some of the boa fat that they were collecting on a tin can. And they give me some of the fat and I take my clothing off, strip down to my shorts, and I begin to smear my body with boa fat. And they're looking at me and I go, it's okay, I'm an anthropologist. <laughs> and they, <clears throat> And I'm thinking, I'm going to come back into the jungle and it's going to smell another boa slithering back into the rainforest. And I make my way back to the clearing and I take the first step and the jungle is full of song. And the second step and the third step and everything stops again. Except for about 600 flies that I had around me. <laughs> and it wasn't until 10 years later that I was able to enter the rainforest and have it continue singing around me have it recognized me as one of its own, as someone who walked with beauty on the earth, who had not been cast out of the garden, who had not been separated from his original nature, who had broken that ancestral curse that we've all inherited, where we can no longer walk with beauty on the earth, speak to the rivers or the trees or to God, and a river will never lie to you. So part of our own healing journey and part of the shamanic healing processes have to do not only with fixing what has gone wrong, but with recovering that original nature, but which our mythology, to a great degree, prevents us from doing, because it is so steeped in the masculine, but it wasn't always so. Because the masculine mythology that we have today in the West, which has become completely bankrupt, it's exhausted itself, was a mythology that arrived 6,000 years ago in Central Europe brought there by Indo-European peoples that decimated and replaced a mythology of the feminine that had pervaded in Central Europe for 35,000 years. In fact, for 35,000 years, the image of the divine was the feminine form, the Paleolithic goddess figures. You've seen those little goddess figures. Many people wear them as pendants. Any archaeological site in Central Europe, you excavate, you come up with the Paleolithic goddesses. And then 6,000 years ago, the representation of the divine changes from the feminine form to the phallus, which is the tree of life, which has been the representation of the divine ever since in the West. But prior to that, you find that it's the feminine form that represents the divine. And Interestingly, if you look at the archaeological record, in that 35,000-year period, there's no evidence of any large-scale warfare in Central Europe for 35,000 years. And if you look at the last 6,000 years of history in Central Europe since the arrival of this mythology of the masculine, the history of Europe has been the history of war. World War I, World War II, the Hundred Years' War, the Thirty Years' War, the War of the Roses, and on and on and on. So the mythology of the feminine is replaced now by a mythology of the masculine that is invasive, aggressive, that is a mythology that informs medicine, that informs science, that informs Western economics, that replaces this mythology of the feminine. But this mythology of the feminine has gone underground and is surfacing again because it is the mythology that promises a possible future for the earth and for our children's children. 
But there's still legacies of that mythology of the feminine. In fact, one of the last legacies is the heart. <laughs> I have a 13-year-old daughter that until last year, for four or five years, she would send me valentines. And she would draw valentines all over my agenda, my planning. Whatever I was working on, she'd come and draw a heart on and say, Daddy, I love you. Daddy, you're the best. And now she's 13 and she writes me notes that says, Daddy, don't tell my friends what you do. Daddy, I don't know you. <laughs> but for five years, she would send me these beautiful valentines. And the valentine, the heart, the shape of the heart is one of the last legacies of this time when the mythologies of the earth were the mythologies of the feminine. Because primary peoples, indigenous peoples, know that the heart doesn't look like that. They've seen chicken hearts and pig hearts and horse hearts. But this is the last legacy of that period, which is what, gentlemen? <laughs> it's the pelvic girdle. It's where all life comes from. It's the source of love in life, which has remained in our collective unconscious as a symbol of, of love. So 6,000 years ago, the Earth peoples that had a mythology of the feminine, the shamanic societies were decimated in Central Europe. The same conquest and invasion happened in the Americas 500 years ago, where Europeans came and brought a mythology of the, fam of the masculine that overrode, that replaced, that banished the mythologies of the feminine, of the Earth peoples here. But actually, it sent them underground like early Christianity that thrived in the catacombs, the shamanic traditions had to go underground and they had to become invisible for all practical purposes. But if you go to Cusco, the city of Cusco, which is the capital of the Inca, I remember about 20 years ago, the, uh, every June 21st, there's a parade of the saints that come out of the cathedral. But this dates back to the colonial times when the Inca would parade the 12 mummies of the 12 Inca, of the 12 rulers, they would take them out on parade once a year on June 21st. And when the priests arrived, they said, you can't do that anymore, but if you want to take the saints out, St. Christopher and St. Margaret, on parade on June 21st, that's fine, that's absolutely okay. So the saints have been taken out on parade. <clears throat> For 500 years and 20 years ago, they were in such terrible disrepair that they had to call restorers in from uh, Paris, from France, to restore these ancient statues of the saints. And when they took the Western robes off, they found that underneath there were Inca robes, that the nails were human nails, the teeth were human teeth, the hair was human hair. They were the mummies, they were the Inca. <clears throat> so the syncretism, the syncretism has occurred all through the Americas as the medicine traditions have gone underground. But today they're resurfacing because we've come to the end of the ways of the masculine. We've exhausted the Western paradigm. We've come to the end of medicine as we know it. We've come to the end of economics as we know it. Do you know what the third leading cause of death in America is today? Hospitals. Doctors and hospitals. Antibiotics, 50 years ago, all staph infections were responsive to antibiotics. 100% of staff was responsive to antibiotics. Today, 26% of staff patients will not respond to any kind of antibiotic. <clears throat> that means that one out of four people that catch a staph infection in a hospital will die. And hospitals have become the third leading cause of death in today's world. We cannot come up with stronger antibiotics because they'll kill the host, us. <laughs> so we have to shift that, that model of medicine, of antimicrobial medicine, of destroying these invading microorganisms that have entered our body has, has failed. We have to switch to a more feminine, more relational medicine, the energy medicine, the shamanic medicine that says, hey, there's no difference between being killed by a microbe or a jaguar. You've got to be in proper relationship with both. We've got to be in proper relationship with the earth. 
We're going up to, you know, our population is expected to be 8 billion people in the planet in the next 10 years. 8 billion people. And I was at a conference in Oxford, in London, in, um, outside of London two years ago, and it was a group of economists, and I was the only shaman in the conference. They were interested in the body of prophecies of the Americas. And they were talking about the currency of the planet, what the global currency was. And I used to think that the global currency was the dollar or the euro. But they were saying, no, the currency of the planet is earth, air, fire, and water. And that's the global currency. And we have been spending it all. We've depleted, we've used up all of the readily available topsoil of the earth, washed it off into the oceans. We used up all the readily available atmosphere and contaminated it, all the readily available waters and polluted them. And we're turning up the heat of the planet. And we're deferring these costs to future generations. We're living off of the planetary credit card. And they were talking about how the Earth can hold the maximum population sustainably <clears throat> of about a billion and a half people riding bicycles to work, no Hummers billion and a half people, and we're coming up to eight billion people on the planet. <clears throat> and they were curious about the Native American prophecies that talked about the coming of 2012 and a culling of humanity that, that, uh, <clears throat> in a time of tremendous crisis that, that we would be facing. And in fact, what's happened in Europe today is that the, one of the most powerful advocacy groups that are asking governments to regulate global warming and to be conscious of global warming are the insurance companies. Not in the US, but in Europe. <clears throat> because they've done the math. They know what happens when global warming occurs and more and more fierce hurricanes happen. They know what their liability costs are going to be. So they're trying to get European governments to do something about global warming. So we are in a time of tremendous crisis in which we have exhausted all of the paradigms of the masculine, in which we have to reclaim the medicine way, the paradigms of the feminine, of sustainability, of deep ecology, of a collaborative relationship with nature, with our bodies. And this is where the medicine traditions come in. Because we're reinventing, we're reinventing each and every one of our paradigms. From healing, <clears throat> for example, we differentiate, we teach our students that there's a difference between healing and curing. That curing is the business of medicine, but we're in the business of healing. That curing is, is associated with an intervention. <clears throat> Excuse me, whereas healing is associated with a journey. We look at healing as journey. That you can remove the affected tissue the compromised organ, but that means that you've had a cure, but you haven't had a healing. If that person hasn't changed their relationship, hasn't changed their diet, if their children still don't speak to them, you don't have a healing happening there. You have a cure and probably most likely a relapse in six months or six years. A healing, on the other hand, involves a reinventing of yourself and embarking on a journey, on an epic journey, that is a sacred journey in which your diet, your lifestyle, your relationships all shift. And a healing will most likely result in a cure, but a cure will seldom ever result in a healing. So we're reinventing all of our paradigms, our paradigms of wellness, our paradigms of healing, our paradigms, our economic paradigms. We've come to the end of economics. We've come to the end of nations. Countries don't exist anymore. You have global corporations. And we are the ones that have to do that. <clears throat> we are the ones that we've been waiting for. Sorry to break the news to some of us. <laughs> we are they. It's up to us to make that shift, to be the midwives of, to do the death rites for a time that has ended, that has exhausted itself, that has nearly decimated the humanity and the planet, and to be the midwives of a new time and of a new set of paradigms and values and practices and relationships. 
And these are the paradigms and the values and the relationships of the medicine way that have been around for 50,000 years, actually 32,000 years in, in the Americas, but that came across the Bering Straits from much more ancient peoples, from the high mountains in Asia. And what I'd like to do next is to go very quickly through the four steps of the medicine way, the, the fourfold path of the medicine way, the four steps to becoming a person of power and knowledge. Because the traditions of the shaman are traditions of power. <clears throat> Our traditions in the West that we're most familiar with are the traditions of prayer, which is a beautiful tradition and part of my daily practice, and the traditions of meditation, which is also a beautiful path and also part of my daily practice. But the way of the shaman is the way of power, of direct communion with spirit. Remember that our task here is to dream the world into being. And to do that, we have to step into our God nature, into our own divine nature to do that. So what the medicine people of old did was to come up with a map that described the four steps where we could, where we could embrace our gifts and take on the responsibility for dreaming the world into being. And they called this fourfold step by many names. And among the people that I trained with, it was known as the medicine wheel, or the way of the four masteries, or the four insights. And it was lined up according to the cardinal directions in the compass. And you began in the south. And you began in the south because in the southern hemisphere, the only point of reference is the southern cross. That's the only point in the sky that doesn't move. So you enter through the south, through the way of the serpent, which is when we call on the four directions, we call on the serpent first. And the way of the serpent was the way of shedding the past, the way the serpent sheds her skin, which is all at once. All at once, not scale by scale like we are accustomed to doing in the West, but all at once. <clears throat> God, I can't believe I'm still working on these mommy issues. Oh, no. <laughs> all of it at once. Shed all of our stories at once and disidentify with our stories. We shed the past the way the serpent sheds her skin. Now, these practices were not only intellectual practices or meditative practices. They were energetic practices <clears throat> where you went through core energetic shifts that shifted the nature of your reality. Core perceptual shifts that shifted your world and the world around you because shamans are people of the percept. In the West, we're people of the precept. Shamans are people of the percept. We are people of the precept. We get precepts, rules. We get 10 commandments. We elect legislators, lawmakers to Congress that pass more laws. If we want to change the world, we pass new legislation. The Greeks were people of the concept. They didn't pass laws. They got ideas, and they understood that there was nothing as powerful as an idea whose time had come. They were people of the concept. Shamans were people of the percept. When they want to change the world, they change their perception of the world. They heal it within them, and the world heals outside. When Mother Teresa was asked why she went to Calcutta, she responded not that she wanted to help the needy and the poor. She said that she went to Calcutta because she had discovered the Hitler within her. So the shaman heals everything within because as you heal it within, then you engage in the perceptual shifts where the world around you is healed, where you heal the poverty in India within you where you heal discrimination so it never lives within you again, where you heal the violence that you perceive happening in the world within you, and that also, that brings healing to everything and everyone around you. And if enough of us do it, we transform the world. So that the path of the shaman begins with our own healing, with healing everything that we perceive to be wrong in the world within us the most hideous, the most violent, the most terrible, we heal it inside. <clears throat> and this is known as the path of the wounded healer, 
where we take that which has been a source of wounding within us, and as we heal it, we transform it into a source of power. So that the source of my compassion is not that I read the Dalai Lama's book, which I think is beautiful, but because I've hurt, and I know what it's like to hurt. And that's where my empathy and my compassion comes from. So that everything that has been a wound within you is now taken and lives within your medicine bag as a source of compassion and as a source of power. And that's the way of the South, the way of the serpent, of shedding the past all at, all at once, of shedding not only our personal past, but our collective past, the nightmare of our collective history, shedding that as well so we're not informed by it. Did any of you, how many of you saw the, the movie Outfoxed? Brilliant, brilliant documentary where they, they documented a study that they did on Fox Television News. And they found that people that watched Fox Television News six hours a day or more knew less about what was happening in the world than people that watched no television. <laughs> <clears throat> Turn off the TV. Cancel your subscription to the newspaper. Because in the South direction of shedding the past, we have to wake up from the cultural trance that we've been educated into. If a nuclear war breaks out somewhere in the planet, one of your neighbors will come and tell you about it. <laughs> but as long as the media, and we don't live in a democracy in America any longer, we live in a mediocracy in America. <laughs> And as long as the media is what provides the collective dream that we all subscribe to, we are in, in the nightmare of our times. So we shed the past the way the serpent sheds her skin, including our collective history of our past. But for the shaman, this isn't only a shedding of your psychological or your emotional history. This is also a shedding of the genetic curses that we have inherited. You know, if you go to your physician and she does a physical exam, she'll tell you, you know, your grandmother died of heart disease. Your uh, grandfather died of heart disease. So you have certain risk factors that, that predispose you to heart disease. And you can't change that. But you can change your diet. You can change your exercise. You can change you can change the risk factors associated with a lifestyle that promotes a healthy heart. If you go to a medicine woman in the Amazon, she'll take her rattle and shake her rattle and look at you and track for you and say, you know, death is stalking you the same way that it stalked your grandmother and your grandfather. And you've got to be careful. Death is stalking you. She's saying the same thing that the physician is. The physician is only talking genetics and, this, and the uh, shaman is talking mythically. But what the medicine woman will say is, and you can become invisible to that death. You don't have to let that predator find you. You can become invisible to that. Now that's contrary to what we believe in in the West. We believe that you cannot change those genes that you inherited, you can only change your diet and your exercise. But the medicine woman is saying to you, you can become invisible to that. You can break free of that generational curse that you've inherited, which is a genetic curse to us. You can change the genetics. I was born with a genetic condition that my children should have inherited, and they did not, that I healed myself of. So when we shed the past, we not only shed the psychological, the emotional, the historical, but also the genetic, inherit the genetic curses that we were burdened with, the genetic inheritance that we got from our mothers and fathers. Because for the shaman, evolution happens differently than for the biologist. For the biologist, evolution happens in between generations, which means that your children will may be smarter and handsomer than you are, but it's too late for you. 
In fact, biology tells us that we're really warm, fussy carriers for our genes. And when they leap off into the next generation, we're pretty, we're done for, we're, you know, we're dispensable. The medicine tradition says, hey, you start getting good when you get over 50. <laughs> and the, uh, yeah. <clears throat> and that's what we, that's what our journey is about. It's a journey to becoming the wise elders. Not, not the foolish old, but the wise elders. And the, um, so what the shaman says is, wait a minute, evolution can happen in between generations, but the most interesting evolution is the one that happens within generations. That we can quantum leap into who we are becoming. Within a single generation, a couple hundred thousand years ago, there was an extraordinary evolutionary quantum leap in which the human brain nearly doubled in size within the space of 10 generations. A whole new brain appeared, the neocortex, within 10 generations. Quantum evolution. And this is what we are looking at today. If you look at the, the, uh, the, the holy book of the Mayans, say that humanity first appears in the planet, do you know when? In the year 2012. That we're still part of the experiment. We're still part of, we're still half cooked. And our task today is to shed that, is to no longer be, in, and we have, by the way, we have broken free of the guiding hand of nature, which is natural selection. We're no longer being guided by nature and evolution. We're a species that has been set adrift in the sea of evolution. Because evolution in the hands of nature happened through natural selection, which meant that one out of 10 babies born died because nature did not consider it fit to survive. But through our practices of modern medicine, we have reduced infant mortality from 16% to less than 1%. So we're choosing to save the lives of weak and infirm children that are transmitting those genes to their offspring. And in the last 50 years, we have conceivably undone the last 50,000 years of evolution by weakening the gene pool. And of course, postponing those health maintenance costs to the later parts of life, which is what's burdening our healthcare system today. And what the shaman says today is, hey, what an extraordinary opportunity. We have no choice but to participate consciously in our evolution. So the question is no longer can we, but dare we take that quantum leap within our generations? Do you know that not a single atom in your body stays in your body for more than eight months? That who you are today, eight months ago, was eagle and whale and salmon and corn and squash? And that eight months from now, who you are will be uh, river and and eagle, and, and butterfly, and grasshopper, and tomato. And what remains, of course, is the luminous energy field. It's the luminous blueprint that organizes the physical body and continues to organize it throughout the course of our lives. Because our skin cells, for example, replicate every week. They die off every week. So we have the opportunity to reinvent ourselves. Every eight months, we create whole new bodies. We grow entirely new bodies. Now, science has really become enamored of DNA in the last decade. DNA is really sexy today. <laughs> 10 years ago, if you put a lot of money into DNA, you'd be very, very rich right now. Genetic engineering, genetic companies is the new future of medicine. Medicine has gone from being antimicrobial antibiotic medicine, and now is genetically-based, DNA-based medicine. It's very sexy, but for the shaman, DNA is simply the hardware that manufactures the proteins that create the body. The software is the really interesting part, which is the luminous energy field. So that if we can access version 7.1, of the software by tracking who we are becoming as a species and as a people 10,000 years from now, we can reinform our DNA 
bring new instructions that will create new bodies that age differently, that heal differently, that will die differently. And this has been what the shaman has always done, is to throw this grappling hook forward into the future to see who we are becoming as a people 10,000 years from now and download that information now so that we can take a quantum leap into who we are becoming. And this is what we do in the south direction in the medicine wheel. We shed the past the way the serpent sheds her skin, all of it, all at once. And then we move into the west, which is the way of the jaguar, which is the way of the warrior. But the way of the luminous warrior, not the old model of the warrior, but the peaceful warrior, the warrior who no longer has any enemies in this world or the next. You no longer have any enemies. You no longer, the legends say that you walk on the snow and you leave no tracks. You no longer cast a shadow. And of course we cast a shadow when we project our own unhealed sides onto another. We no longer need to create enemies. I remember living in New York City. I moved to New York City for about a year, 20 years ago. And I lived in the area, the, the South Broadway area, in the Soho, before it became chic. And I remember going home the first day that I, I had my new apartment, walking home and walking past all of these muggers and, and rapists and, 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 and child molesters and, and stabbers. And, and, and a month later, I got to know them all. They were my neighbors. They were. <laughs> They were perfectly nice people. They had just had that New York look. You know, you have to have a look in New York. So, you, so, and it was all my projection. I was seeing muggers and stabbers and rapists. They were perfectly nice people. So the way of the luminous warrior, you no longer need to create enemies. You no longer need to create adversaries outside of you. You have no enemies. You know, you cast no shadow. And we live in a country that cast a huge shadow, an extraordinary shadow, where we invade small countries like Grenada to preserve democracy, where we don't, we, we don't inhale. <laughs> you know, it's a tremendously moralistic. It's, it, it, we live in a, in a society that cast a huge shadow. So the way of the warrior is the way of practicing integrity, of living in integrity, of stepping beyond fear, of stepping beyond violence, of stepping beyond death, of journeying beyond death. So you're no longer stalked by death. You become invisible to death. You become invisible to the lifelessness that stacks, that stalks our culture and our society. So it's the way of the luminous warrior, a breaking free from fear, because as you break free from fear, you recognize that fear is an acronym that stands for false evidence appearing real. So your, the lenses of your perception become cleansed. What happens in the west direction of the jaguar is that you learn the way back home, back home to the spirit world. Now, you learn the way back home now, why you still have a body to come back to, because you don't want to be asking for directions when you make your final journey. It's not a good time. You learn the way back home to the spirit world. And you do that through the process of dying. You die the symbolic death, the shaman's death, that you are then born into your power and your grace and your beauty. From the west direction, we move to the north, which is the way of the hummingbird. And you saw when we opened sacred space that we called, that we called on the four directions. And the way of the north is the way of the ancestors. It's the way of hummingbird. And hummingbird, the hummingbirds are extraordinary. Creatures. Do you know that they migrate from Brazil to Canada? And they go, they go on these epic journeys. They don't hang around going, you know, we don't have enough wings. My 401k plan isn't fully funded yet. I don't have enough time. I, they go. They go on the epic journey. 
they, you know, there's no flowers to suck on until we get to Cuba. What are we going to do? They just go. <clears throat> and they come back from Canada <laughs> to Brazil. So the hummingbird represents that epic traveler and also represents that phase in the shaman's training where you begin to feed directly from essence, from nectar. You feed directly from the essence of life. You no longer feed on anything that has died. You no longer feed on death. And the, the north direction, the way of the hummingbird, is the way of stepping outside of time. And it's the way of the ancient teachings of the medicine way, which you cannot get to until you have done your healing work in the south and in the West. Otherwise, the medicine teachings in the North become only a set of cliches. So in the North, you step outside of time. You learn that there are many kinds of time, that there's one kind of time that we are very familiar with, which is linear time, monochronic time, that flies like an arrow, in which the future is always ahead of us, the past has already happened. And you learn that there are other kinds of time, but in this linear time that flies like an arrow, the main operating principle is cause and effect, causality, the basis of science. The problem with time that flies like an arrow is that it breeds psychologists and psychotherapists. <laughs> because you are always the result of an earlier cause, of something that happened to you when you were 12 and when you were six, or if you do past life therapy before you were born or 20 lifetimes ago. So you're always at the mercy of the past. The past continues spilling into the present and claiming the present, whether it be our genes or our psycho-emotional history. But shamans discovered that there's another kind of time that turns like a wheel. That was sacred time, that's polychronic not monochronic, that turned like a wheel and where the main operating principle was synchronicity, not causality, but synchronicity, where you could influence events that had occurred in the past, where you could nudge destiny. And they were able to break free of ordinary time into nonlinear or sacred time to steer the course of their personal destiny, to steer the course of their village. And this is what medicine people have always done. If you lived in a, in a coastal village, you took the fishermen to where the fish were going to be the following morning, not to where they had been yesterday, because you would be out of a job. You took them to where the fish were going to be. If you were in a hunting, community, you took them to where the bison were going to be the following morning. You made sure that your timeline of your village hunters intersected with the timeline of the bison the following morning. Because if you got there and there were fresh tracks on the ground and you said, uh-oh, they were here an hour ago, anybody see them? <laughs> no good. <clears throat> so you were able to, able to break free of ordinary time and step into timelessness, step into infinity. And it was in infinity that you discovered the wisdom teachings that were infinite. That could not have been subjugated by the conquistador because they thrived and existed in infinity. And then you became steeped in the wisdom teachings directly. Because remember that the medicine way is one, is a path of direct knowledge. It's not what you learn from your teacher. Your teacher guides you to, there's no guru, there's no hierarchical structure, it's a horizontal structure. And there's no hierarchy. You don't kiss a ring on his finger. There's no priest or bishops or archbishops. There's you and spirit. And you can sit with the Dalai Lama of the Inca or of the Hopi or with, the Hopi don't have one, but. And, uh, and have a cup of tea with them. But when you're in ceremony, you know you're sitting next to a jaguar. So in the medicine traditions, it's you and spirit. And this is what happens in the north direction. 
is that you take, you accept an invitation. You take a seat. You accept a place that has been held for you for so long around a sacred fire. You accept the stewardship of all living beings in the earth. And you accept the responsibility of dreaming the world into being. All of it. And in the process of doing so, you take responsibility for the entire world as your dream. So you want to change the world, you change your dream. We dream it differently. <clears throat> Which is what we do in the way of the east, the east direction. <clears throat> Which is the way of the seer. But before we get to that, just very briefly, in, the, in stepping outside of time, when we live in the grip of linear time, which is Western time, which is clock time, you know, in the Andes, the early and late are a condition of the day. They're not a condition of man. You're never early and you're never late. You're there when you get there. In fact, if you get somewhere an hour late, you go, in South America, you go. If you get there three hours late, you go. If you get there two days late, you go. <laughs> so you're never early or late. Early and late is a condition of the day, not of humans. You get there when you get there, when you're supposed to get there. You missed the train, you didn't miss the train. You were not supposed to be in that train. So it takes off a tremendous amount of stress and responsibility for what happens in your life. <clears throat> Have you ever driven to work and hit all the red lights <laughs> and known that perhaps you should have stayed in bed and at the end of the day you know that you should have stayed in bed? <laughs> and you've also driven to work and gotten all the green lights. So we work then on maintaining proper relationship that in the Andes we call Aini of being in proper relationship with the universe to give it an opportunity to conspire on our behalf so that we don't have to micromanage it all the time. So we can throw our day planner out. <clears throat> My assistant said to me a couple of months ago, Alberto, you have three lunch dates today. I go, I do? What time are they for? He said, they're all for one o'clock in the afternoon. I go, are they in the same restaurant? <laughs> so two of them are. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, uh, so I said, okay. So I, I said, I'd asked her, please call two of these people and see if I can see them in the next few days. Couldn't get through to anybody. She said, what are you going to do? I said, nothing. I'm going to go pray. I'm going to go meditate. When sat and meditated, half an hour later, one of them called to cancel, and the other one called to reschedule. So what do we do? We come back into proper relationship instead of trying to force it or micromanage it. So the, from the north we go to the east, which is the way of the seer, which is the way of the seer, which is the way, and when I'm talking about the shaman today, I'm talking about a particular kind of shaman, which is the sage. There are many, many responsibilities and duties of the shaman. One of them is to be the healer. Those shamans are generally associated with the way of the serpent of the south. Other shamans are the, more, are the ones that will lead you to where the game are. They are the hunters, the trackers. They're associated with the west direction of jaguar. The, the healer shamans that work with herbs, the midwives, the bone setters are essential in every traditional community. But the kind of shaman that I'm speaking about today are the sages, the wisdom keepers. And my mentor, who was an old Indian, <clears throat> he was an old Indian man, that tutored me, mentored me for 25 years in, in the high Andes, believed that the new shamans, that the new caretakers of the earth would come from the West, that they are us, that we are the ones that we've been waiting for. And I also believed that. I also believed, I believed that we have been together before many, many times around a fire with the buffalo behind us or praying on a temple above the snow line in a stone temple. And that we are born, we reincarnate as villages, <clears throat> as, 
as villages that have a mission, that come with a vision and a mission to make a difference at this time, in, the, in, in this time of tremendous upheaval and tumult in the world, that we come to be islands of peace in the middle of a tremendous storm. That a shaman, you know, I, I compare the task, the role of the shaman <clears throat> to that of people that live in an island and a storm is coming and when a storm comes in an island, you want to move to the high ground. And the shamans, what they do is they go get their surfboards and go to the beach. <laughs> this is what we came here to do. Remember that before we were born. <clears throat> before we were born, we were all gathered in a great grassy plain. And this very big angel came out. And they said, it's going to be a very difficult time in history. Tremendously challenging. Ecological upheaval, warfare. Famine, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, tremendous upheaval in humanity, great opportunity to make a difference in the world. Who wants to go? You all raised your hands. You didn't want to miss the party. You didn't want to be left out. This is what we came to do. This is what we came to do. <clears throat> and the way of the sage is the way of the shaman that heals everything within. And then once everything is healed within, everything is healed in the world outside. We heal the violence in the Middle East within. We heal hunger in India within us. And then we can heal, hold a vision of a world that lives in peace because we've become peace. Of a world that lives in abundance because we've become abundance. Scarcity no longer lives within me of a world that has a future totally different from the, that which is provided by the nightmare of our past because we embodied that future. We already live it. We walk it. We walk that beauty in our walk. If you ask a Navajo medicine woman, who are you? And there's some beautiful Navajo poetry. She'll say to you, the mountains am I, the red rock canyon walls am I, the desert wind am I. If you ask me, who are you, Alberto, I tell you, well, when I was 12 years old, my father left, and I never had a positive role model of what it was to be an adult male, and I'm still looking for an adult male role model. <laughs> uh, please. <clears throat> who are you? The mountains am I. That butterfly that was born underneath a giant fern in the Amazon am I. The desert wind am I. That child that had nothing to eat in India today am I. That's who we are. Erase your psychosocial history. Feed that to the jaguar that stalks the death of the time that has already passed. And walk that talk. Walk that beauty. So we become peace. I remember my mentor was... He was a very harsh man, very, very, very direct. He tolerated no, no stu very little stupidity. And, the, um, and he used to say to me, Alberto, we need to heal you. I said, I'm fine. He said, no, we need to heal your ignorance. I said, my ignorance? I have a PhD. He said, exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> and, the, uh, and one time we came to a village, and the... Um, and it, a village where it hadn't rained for a long time. And in the high Andes, the, they depend on the rains to refill the lagoons that, that provide irrigation water during the, the, uh, the dry season. And we came to this village, and the people at the village said to him, call the rains force, call the rains. And he asked for a hut where he meditated for four days. Came out on the fourth day, and I saw him walking off to the edge of the plateau of the Altiplano where it drops down into the Amazon. I said, where are you going? And he said, I'm going to go and pray rain. I said, I, told you, I said, you mean you're going to go and pray for rain? And he said, no, I'm going to go and pray rain. And he came back three hours later, and the sky was full of dark, big, juicy thunderclouds, and the rains broke, and everybody in the village was ecstatic, and they were thanking him. And he said, it rained. They were saying, you made it rain. He said, no, I didn't. It rained. And then I got what he was doing because what he had done was to embody rain, to become rain. 
he no longer prayed to a god or spirit or the clouds to bring rain. He and spirit were one. And he became rain and the rains came. And that's what our task today is, is to become peace, is to pray peace. We pray healing. We don't pray for healing. We pray healing into being. We pray abundance. We become abundance. There's no scarcity in our lives. I asked my mentor one time. He lived in a stone hut overlooking the Amazon and high in the mountains. And I said, how can you live in such poverty? And he stepped outside his hut and he went to the snow-capped mountains. He said, who's the poor one? So we heal everything within. Everything we heal, we heal. Then we have nothing that we need to fix. Then we can be extraordinarily effective in the world. And many months later, I asked him about that village. I said, do you always have to go and pray for four days before you can pray rain? And he said, no, I can pray rain in five minutes. I said, why did it take you four days? And he said to me, because that village was so out of balance that I became out of balance. And before I could do anything, I had to come back into balance again. The minute that I came back into balance, the village came back into balance and the rains came. So thank you very much, everyone. Walk in beauty. Many blessings to you. Thank you. Please, please join me for another moment as we close the directions that we opened. Great serpent, Hatunamaru, thank you, Mother, for showing us your ways. Be with us, Mother. Allow us to walk with beauty. Teach us to touch everyone we touch with beauty. Ho. <laughs> to the winds of the west, Mother, Sister, Jaguar, thank you, Mother. Thank you for walking among us. Accompany us as we go back to our homes and our villages and our loved ones. Be by our sides. Teach us the ways of fearlessness in this time of tremendous change. Oh. <laughs> to the winds of the north, <clears throat> grandmothers and grandfathers, ancient ones. Guardians, keepers of this land, hummingbird, thank you. Thank you for being with us. Ho. Oh. <laughs> Mother, sister, eagle, condor, hatun kuntur, thank you for holding us sweetly under your wings. Be with us always. Ho. Oh. Pachamama, Santa Tierra, Mother Earth, thank you, Mother. Thank you for holding us so sweetly, for your breath and your waters, and to all our relations, the stone people, the plant people, the wing, the furred, the finned, all our relations. Ho! Oh. <laughs> Inti Taita, Father Son, Grandmother Moon, to all the star nations, our star brothers and sisters, Ilya Tixiwira Kocha, great spirit, thank you. You who sit above us and below us, you who sit in the north, the south, the east, and the west, thank you for bringing us together today, for allowing us to sing the song of life one more day. Ho. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. There's a voice that said to us, and cursed is the earth because of you, and you, and you too, woman. And to the man, the voice said, and with the sweat of your back, you will take your food from the earth, 
and it shall grow thorns and thistles for you. The vo I'm not making this up. This is page two. And you, you can check this out next time you stay at a motel. Because right at the beginning of our mythology, we managed to piss off the feminine and the earth. Because curse is the earth because of you, woman. And to the man, the, the voice did not say, and the earth shall grow papayas and strawberries and mangoes for you. No, it said, the earth shall grow thorns and thistles and with the sweat of your back. So we enter into a hostile relationship with the earth, right at the beginning of our mythology, with the feminine and with the mother. And later on, we learned that matter, like the stool or this table, is not spiritual. That spirit is something separate from matter. And of course, if you remember your Latin, where does the word matter come from? From mother, from maternity, maternal matter. So, the, so our mythology from the very beginning is rather funky. For example, it also tells us that the masculine gives birth to the feminine. Remember that part of the story with the rib? We have the only mythology in which the masculine gives birth to anything. <laughs> to anything. <clears throat> so, the, um, so our mythology really predisposes us to a perceiving reality in a particular way. For example, in our mythology, we have an independent evil principle. We've identified an independent evil principle. For the shamanic societies, there's no independent evil principle. Evil exists, but only in the hearts of men and women. There's no independent evil principle that you have to protect yourself from. But for us, there is. We have a universe in which there is a Darth Vader. And, the, and we have to wear the amulets and protect ourselves from the... Whereas in the indigenous traditions, we live in a benign universe that will actually go out of its... Thank you, and welcome, everyone. And I'd like to ask you to join me in an opening prayer as we call on the four directions, on the four corners of the world to be with us as we open sacred space. And in the medicine traditions, we always work within sacred space. <laughs> to the winds of the south. Hatunamaru, great serpent, mother of the waters, we call on you, mother. Come and wrap your coils of light around us. Teach us your way, the beauty way, to walk with beauty on the earth, to shed the past the way you shed your skin, to touch everyone we touch with beauty. Be with us. Ho! To the winds of the west, Otorongo, mother, sister, jaguar, we call on you, mother. Come and walk among us. Teach us your ways of integrity, of impeccability, of fearlessness, of stepping beyond death. Be with us. Ho! Oh. <laughs> to the winds of the north, grandmothers and grandfathers, ancient ones, guardians and keepers of this land, you who've walked here before us, we come to honor you today, and you who will come after us, our children's children. Hummingbird, we call on you, teaches your ways of drinking deeply from the essence of life. Ho! Oh. <laughs> to the winds of the east, the place of the rising sun, mother eagle, sister eagle, condor, we call on you. Come, Mother, teach us your ways of soaring above the clouds and the ways of the nest and the ways of the caring of the young. Be with us. Ho! Santa Tierra Pachamama, Great Mother, Mother Earth, thank you, Mother, for holding us so sweetly, for your breath, for your waters, and to all our relations, the stone people, the plant people, the creepy crawlies, the winged, the furred, the finned, all our relations. Ho! Thank you.
best way to conspire in your behalf if you're in proper relationship with it. Now, medicine picks up on the same mythology and says that we live in a universe that you have to be protected from, that the minute that you cut your skin, that there are invisible microorganisms that are coming and feeding and having sex inside you. <clears throat> well, biology doesn't quite put it that way, but it's, this is what they're saying, that the minute you cut your skin, you are exposed to this hostile environment that will become predatory. And that whereas in the medicine traditions, the, of course it's a good idea if you cut yourself to, to, you know, to wash the cut and to rinse it off, but in the medicine traditions, we live in a benign universe. In fact, for the shaman, there's no difference between being killed by a microbe and being killed by a jaguar. They're exactly the same. Whereas for us in the West, being killed by a microbe is an illness, and being killed by a jaguar is an accident. Poor Sally, she got eaten by a cat. Bad luck. For the shaman, they're identical. They're exactly the same thing. There's no difference between the two of them. We have to be in proper relationship with microbes and with jaguars. Otherwise, they both begin to look at you as lunch. But if you're in proper relationship with them, you're no longer part of their food chain. So this is an essential element of the medicine traditions. I've worked with clients who have, I remember we get a lot of physicians that come into our, into our healing the light body training where we train Western shamans. But they generally come to us when they are hurting. And I remember this physician who came who had been diagnosed with cancer who, says to me, Alberto, the chemo isn't working. And we have three sessions together. He comes in on the fourth session, and he says, great news, great news, the chemo is starting to work. <laughs> I go, what? <laughs> the chemo is working. It's like, fabulous, fantastic. Then he signed up in our, and became part of our training program and is now a shaman physician who practices shamanic medicine in the ER which is a fabulous place to practice shamanic medicine, projecting it onto another. So the medicine way is a spiritual path, and it's founded in a mythology that is very different from our Western mythology, because it's a mythology of the feminine. And in the West, we have a mythology that is very much of the masculine. <clears throat> we have a rather funky mythology in the West, in fact. And I want to review some of these elements so that we can better grasp the, the context and the, and the arena in which shamanism thrives. Joseph Campbell used to say, I, I remember having dinner with him many, many years ago, and he said two things to me. He said, Alberto, if you don't learn it, you end up marrying it. <laughs> that was number one. And number two is, we'd had a couple of glasses of wine, was that reality, what we call reality, are those myths that we haven't quite seen through yet. Reality are those myths that we have not quite seen through yet. And I'd like for us to take a moment and look at our Western mythology, because mythology informs and organizes, provides us with the lenses through which we perceive reality. <clears throat> so, the, in our Western mythology, for example, we have the only mythology in the planet in which we were cast out of the garden. Did you know that? That nobody else was kicked out of the garden. The Aborigines weren't, the Sub-Saharan Africans weren't, the Native Americans weren't. They were given the garden to be the stewards and the caretakers of the garden. But we were cast out of the garden. We were cast out of our original nature where we used to walk with God. We used to speak to the rivers and to the trees and to the clouds, and the rivers and the trees and the clouds, and God would speak back to us. And as we suffered this initial, this original soul loss that we've all inherited, we are still paying for the sins of our great-grandparents. 
We've been banished from our original nature. Nobody else on the planet was. In fact, the Aborigines, the Native Americans, were given the garden to be the stewards and the caretakers of the garden. They were not banished from the garden. Not only that, as we were being banished from the garden, Inti Taita, Father Sun, Grandmother Moon, Hatun Chaska, to all the star nations, our star brothers and sisters, Yapanapukuna, the sacred mountains of this land, Anilia Tixi Wirakocha, Great Spirit, Creator of all, you who are known by a thousand names and you who are the unnameable one, thank you for bringing us together today to celebrate the Song of Life one more day. Ho! Oh. So the shaman is the person who mediates between the visible and the invisible world. And it's an individual who traditionally, who comes from a traditional culture, from an aboriginal culture, not from, a, not from an industrial culture, not from a developed culture, but from a, the societies of the earth peoples, the people that work the earth, that work the land, from traditional societies. And shamanism is not a religion, like we like to think of it sometimes. But it's a spiritual tradition, it's a spiritual path. Because religion, in fact, you can be a Jew, a Christian, a Muslim, a, uh, an atheist, and still be a shaman. Because religion is built on belief, is founded on belief, whereas shamanism is founded on experience. It's a spiritual path founded on your experience and honoring, of course, the experience of those who've come before us. But it's not based on the experience that someone had 2,000 years ago. And the difference between the priest and the shaman is that the priest celebrates and memorializes an event that occurred 2,000 years ago, whereas the shaman celebrates and memorializes this moment, this instant right here. And there's no Buddha, there's no Christ, there's no Muhammad that says, follow my footsteps. It says, follow your own footsteps. And if you meet the Christ, bow to the Christ. If you meet Muhammad, bow to Muhammad. If you meet the Buddha, kill the Buddha. <laughs> this is what the Buddhists say. Because if you happen to meet the Buddha on the road, you know that you've missed the Buddha because you are the Buddha. You've missed your own Buddha nature. You're